This is the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, episode 26. You're listening to the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, the number one resource for running a profitable home recording studio. Now your hosts, Brian Hood and Chris Graham. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, where we post new episodes every single Tuesday morning. This episode is all about systems, but before we get into today's episode, I want to mention something. I want to give a little shout out to our listeners. Uh, That's you, actually. If you're listening to this, then you are a listener. We just crossed the 100 review threshold in the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. So anyone that has left a review, I want to say personally, thank you so, so much. I want to read just one of my favorite reviews here. This review is a five-star review from username Euladine or Euladine. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it, but Euladine says, this podcast is exactly what I need. I try to learn new things every day, but until I discovered the Six Figure Home Studio blog and supplemental materials, aka the podcast, I didn't have a clear plan for where I should focus my learning. As far as I'm aware, the Six Figure Home Studio is the only resource that really focuses on the business side of running a studio as their main thing. And I have a lot to learn in this area. This podcast is especially great because I can learn while driving, cooking, or doing some other tasks that may require my visual attention. It's so refreshing to hear someone say that fancy gear isn't as important as I'd been led to believe in the past. I'm always hearing people talk about why they choose this single channel $3,000 preamp for their hi-hat mic over some other single channel $3,000 preamp. And I'm over here like, I will never spend that much money on a mic preamp while simultaneously worrying that maybe I'm too cheap because I'd rather put that money into something that would be a bigger difference, like having my own room to track drums in. It's just really nice to hear that it's okay not to be obsessed with gear I can't afford and that I can make great records right now with what I have. This podcast is a godsend. That, my friends, is a good review. If someone were to be reading the reviews for the Six Figure Home Studio podcast and they were unsure as to whether this podcast was for them or not, that review is extraordinarily helpful. Now, let me show you what is not a good review. This is from username Dope Smoke, and the review says, it is a five-star review, so thank you for that, but it says, this podcast is the Dope Smoke flame emoji, tree emoji, tree emoji. That is not a helpful review, although it does help us because we do need reviews. So here's what I want to do. We love getting reviews. We love getting five-star reviews, especially, but we love to get very informative reviews, reviews that are very helpful for people that are unsure if this podcast is great for them. So here's what I want to do. For the rest of May, if you leave us a review, an honest review, and you screenshot that review, and you post your screenshot of your review, not someone else's review, your review on the Six Figure Home Studio community, which you can access. If you're not a member already, you can just, you can join for free. Just go to the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash community or just search Facebook for the Six Figure Home Studio community. If you leave the screenshot of your review in our community in the month of May, then I will be going through and personally picking what I feel like is the most helpful of those reviews that are posted. Whoever I pick, whoever I think had the most helpful review uh, of all the people that ended up posting, I'm gonna give you a free 30 minute one-on-one uh, coaching session, meaning we can, we can talk through anything that you wanna talk about when it comes to your business, or we can talk about coffee if that's what you're into. But I really wanna reward those who took the time to relieve these detailed, highly helpful reviews. So again, you can just leave a review, screenshot your review, post the review in our Facebook community, And at the end of May, I'm going to be going through and picking what I think is the most helpful review. And uh, I will be giving you a free one-on-one coaching session. And the reason we need you to screenshot this and post it in Facebook is because we don't know who you are just reading through the iTunes reviews. Most likely, uh, it's just a username or a made-up name like Dope Smoke. (laughs) That doesn't help us much. But yeah, post it in the Facebook community. Most helpful will get a free 30-minute one-on-one with me. And I'll pick at the end of the month. So without further delay, here's my conversation about systems with Chris Graham. Chris Graham, how you doing today, buddy? I am feeling good. It's April 19th. It's snowing in Ohio. No, it's not. Are you serious? Yes, it's snowing. I just went for a walk today. I was like 78 degrees. It sucks for you, man. Yeah. I had literally the worst morning of my life today, okay? Let me just tell you what happened. If you haven't listened to this podcast before, you may not have heard that I am now into coffee roasting. So I roast my own beans, right? And I go through this excruciating process of grinding them, and getting the water to the appropriate temperature of 176 degrees and then getting all my stuff set up for my aero press and all this fun stuff. I literally get this perfect cup of coffee made and it's just sitting there as I'm cooking breakfast, waiting for me to enjoy it. And I 
I got my eggs. I got my oatmeal. I got, I'm going to get my cup of coffee. I reach out for it and I just fucking palm it and shove it against the back of my sink <laughs> to where the coffee goes all over my counter. It sprays up to where, you know, in a kitchen, you'd have a backsplash there, but I don't have a backsplash. I imagine this is what backsplashes are for, but the coffee goes all up the wall on the drywall and just this glorious cup of coffee in which I spend so much time, effort and put all of my being into and it's just on the counter getting all over my appliances. And I said horrible things to no one in particular, but that was my morning. I immediately made another cup and everything's good now. I wanted this moment to be stuck in eternity in podcast world. So I never forget today. Yeah. You got to be careful with the coffee, man. Anyways, let's talk about things that actually matter other yes. than my misfortunes for coffee. And that is our topic today. Our topic today is all about systems. Indeed. I think this is going to be a good episode, high value for people. We're going to kind of fly through and just list off systems you can implement today in your studio and make more money per hour. Yeah. So this is another uh, advice buffet, if you will. We have had several of these in the past. People seem to like them because no matter where you are in your business or career, you can usually pull one or two of these out for you to actually implement into your business. And you never know which one of these is going to be an aha moment. So we have about I don't know, 15 or 16 of these. Uh, who knows if we'll add some by the end here, but we're just going to kind of breeze through these. Some will take longer than others, but we do think that every single person can pull at least one or two of these out and implement it today into your business in order to make it more efficient. And the goal with this, me and Chris were talking beforehand, the goal with this isn't to just remove yourself from your business and remove yourself from interactions with the artists and stuff. The goal is really to make yourself more present with your customers and clients so that you're not tied up in all this tedious bullshit that you're doing every day. That's just eating up your time, effort, and energy. Yeah. I remember when I first got started in audio, very stressful to record people for a living. It's a lot of knobs and buttons and cables. And I remember, you know, I'd work with an artist in my first few years of doing this and they'd ask a question while I was doing something ridiculous to get the session set up. And it was just this, uh, can't you see that I'm working? And that's not the way to, to run a business. That's not the way to treat people. And the beauty of systems are that, you know, when you have less to do, when you're with a client, when you're in trying to get into a flow state, whether you're mastering, whether you're mixing, whether you're recording, whatever it happens to be, you can be a better human being and treat people with love and respect. And people generally tend to hire those types of people more. And I want to go and kind of touch on the, stereotypical audio engineer. Did you say stereo? <laughs> God, I hate you. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> the stereotypical audio engineer, which is they're really grumpy, right? They're super grumpy. Uh, I've worked with those in my past. I have been that in my past. And if you are not that, then you probably know somebody that, that fits that stereotype. And the stere that stereotype is there for a reason, because most, most audio engineers are grumpy and if they're not right now, they have been in their past. And I'd like to say that at least in my experience and from what I've seen in other, in other audio engineers that I've worked with that were grumpy, a lot of it's because they have not figured out this systems thing yet. Yeah. They're still dealing with that tedious bullshit that literally will suck your soul away to where you don't want to do anything. You don't want to experience it. You, don't, you just don't want to talk to anyone. You don't want anything to happen. You just like get it done and let's, let's get this over with so I can like go binge Netflix or whatever, because you just have no energy to deal with things. And if you can get the system stuff in place and get it down, you're going to have a lot better time in your career. And probably it's going to help your career out because you're going to have a lot more energy to put into your clients. You know, I remember when I first started getting my systems right, when I first started building them out. Um, and I remember being on the phone with a client um, and thinking to myself, oh my gosh, why am I being so friendly? <laughs> Oh, it's because I'm not miserable because I have pretty good systems in place and I don't have like this crazy, insane workload that I have to like that drains me of all my energy, all my intelligence and all my, you know, general good human beingness. So, yeah, this is going to be a buffet of just different systems that you can implement. So keep in mind, some of these are going to be really simple and you're going to say, duh, everyone does that. For each one of these issues, we're going to have a portion of our audience that's going to say, duh, and another portion that's going to say, what? Life changed. And just like any buffet, you just pick the pieces you want out of there and you can just leave the rest for the other people. Yep. So we have four different types of systems. We broke them into four different subsections. We have session systems, data systems, physical systems, and communication systems. Well, that sounds awfully scary and professional. What do we mean by these four sessions? Well, we're going to get into these and we're going to break 
down each of these one at a time. The easiest one, I think the one most people can relate to, and that is session systems. These are things happening inside your recording or mixing or mastering sessions. The things you're hopefully doing every day if you're doing this full time. Absolutely. Yeah. So the first one, and this is, you know, we're starting at the bottom here. This is a really simple one. Standard track labels. If you are a recording engineer, if you are a mixing engineer, to make a decision one time that the main vocal track in every project you work on from here on out is going to be called, typically for most people, it's Vox, V-O-X. To call your main vocal track your Vox track and just to say, hey, from now on, my vo- main vocal track will always be called Vox and it will always be on the far left-hand side of the, of the mixing board. Or it's always going to be on track 10 or, you know, it's these types of decisions where you make them one time and then you start to get muscle memory when you're working on a project and you just reach over and, you know, grab the fader that's the vocal fader. And it also helps when you're opening old sessions or whenever you're, you know, diving between multiple sessions, if you're juggling multiple artists at the same time so that you know where everything is. And I'll go further and say I'm a Pro Tools user, so I actually have specific track colors for each instrument. So, you know, the bass will be lime green the drums will be you know a shade of blue the vocals will be sometimes pink sometimes purple Um, you know all of my different guitars will be uh, kind of a darker blue or light purple because i want to be able to visually as i'm scrolling through the session without even having to read the vocal tracks i know which grouping of colors are my instruments or the thing i'm looking for and you may think like okay who cares you know i can just read the track but at the end of the day Every time you can shave off just a fraction of a second or just a few seconds here or there, when you do that hundreds of times a day and you're, you know, trying to scroll through hundreds of tracks and it saves you four or five seconds here or there, that shit, that really adds up a lot. And if you can get this part down and make it just part of your go-to workflow, no matter what you do, this is the way you label things. It's going to make your life a lot easier from this point on. And most people have some sort of thing that they do, but they haven't really sat down and thought out and maybe even written down how they do things. Even if it means you have a post-it note next to your computer screen as you're figuring this stuff out and that you go to that every time you set up a new session or every time you, do I spell out the word Tom or do I put TM1, TM2? You know, those little things, especially when we get to the next thing, which is templates. In Pro Tools, you know, whenever you're trying to import templates and tracks, sometimes it'll try to match tracks inside of Pro Tools based on the name. And if they're named different things, it won't match up accurately. You're going to have a whole headache of things to go on. So I don't want to go too off in the weeds with this, but I think it's just very important that you have a standard way you name every single track and instrument. Yeah. So let me just throw one more piece in here. If you're a drummer, you probably set your drums up the same time every time you play. If you're a guitar player, you probably have your strings in the same order on the guitar every time you play. The same order being the lowest string on the bottom and the highest string on the top. These are systems. And the reason we have these systems is when you get used to a system, you can get into a flow state. Oh, can you imagine trying to play guitar if you change the strings in different orders every single time you play it? You couldn't do, you couldn't do it. It's because you have that muscle memory around that one system of strings, low to high. And if you were to change that up, even one string, you would be a shit show. So imagine that in your sessions every day. Well, if you label things differently or put things different in different orders in your session or have different colors every single time, you're essentially relearning your session every single time you open it. So I love what you just said there with that. Yeah, you can't hit a flow state. And a flow state is, that's the money word right here. When you hit a flow state, you do better work faster. You're being a true artist. And for me as a mastering engineer, everything revolves around getting me to a flow state, getting me to a point where I am not even consciously doing it. It becomes a subconscious act in the same way that playing the guitar well or playing the drums well, that you get into that flow state and it starts to work really well. Yep, I agree 100%. So let's go on to the next one, which we just talked about a little bit, which, which is templates. And a lot of people either swear by templates or they stay far, far away from templates. And no matter where you stay on this, I think templates have an extremely important part of any recording studio. I think we should tackle two of these points at the same time. That's plug-in presets and templates, because the biggest benefit, there's, there's two ways to do session templates. One is just, you have a session template and that's your all your track names, all your track colors, all your track orders, all that stuff, and no plugins on it. That's one way to do it. The second way to do it is have all your standard plugins, all that same shit you load every single time, your go-to plugins with the go-to settings as a starting point. In my opinion, especially if you're doing a genre that you're very familiar with, you have your go-tos. I think having a session template with your plugin presets is a great way to really cut down on doing the same exact shit you do every time and just having a good starting point. Because 
the time you spend resetting up all those plugins to do roughly the same thing you do every time, you could spend that time instead tweaking things and using that plugin uh, preset as a starting point. Feel free to add your two cents here, Chris, but as a mixing engineer, templates are a huge part of what I do and it allows me to have more freedom for experimentation because I have so much extra time because I'm not setting up all this shit every single time from the very start. Well, I think that there's something you see in our industry. You get these people I would call template collectors or preset collectors and they're obsessed with like, oh, I just want presets from all these different guys and if I get the presets then I'm going to be able to do the work they can do just as well. You have to have the underlying knowledge of why they're using the settings they're using, not just what they're doing. Yeah, so don't fixate on presets, don't, especially on plug-in presets. The plug-in preset is really valuable once you have a system that helps you get into a flow state. They're not really valuable at all until then because so many of them, especially compressors, are threshold-based. The volume of the audio completely ruins the preset. So the next session systems, the last one we've got for you guys here are hotkeys, baby. Yeah, hotkeys, I think, are a huge part of any professional audio engineer or recording engineer or mastering. I mean, all of us have hotkeys that we love to use. Some are better than others at remembering them. I know for some reason, I just have this amazing knack for remembering a hotkey the first time I ever use it. So some people, I see this, oh God, it's so frustrating. When I work with someone else or someone comes in my studio as an assistant or I work at another studio and I have, you know, let's just say an in-house guy there to watch them use the mouse and go <laughs> to like track and then group or edit and then paste or something, you know, they don't even know control C, control V, like the most basic of shit. I just want to smack them and say, dude, get it together because you will never, ever be able to run a session with any proficiency if you can't figure out how to do hotkeys. Yeah, be a hotkey ninja. And uh, I think a hotkey ninja, it depends on the software you're using. Some software, it's harder to change the hotkeys. And in some cases, it's better to just use the factory presets. But I would say with the hotkeys, you know, one of the things that I do is I run scripts off of hotkeys. So if I have something where I want to get from a session to the, all the emails from a client, I can hit one button and it takes me right there and searches my email account for all that stuff. So the hotkeys are amazing. When in doubt, and we'll come back to this more later, get a label maker, print out stuff. If you can customize your own hotkeys and feel free to put stickers on your keyboard. For Pro Tools, they actually have keyboard overlays you can put on your keyboard. Honestly, like if you're learning, maybe that works well. But for me, I just think about what am I trying to accomplish and what's the shortcut for that? What's the hotkey for that? What's the, the quickest way to do it? If I'm hitting right click and copy or if i'm selecting a track and going to edit and hitting copy then going to where i want it pasted and going to edit and going to paste that doesn't work for me i don't ever want to use my mouse for anything i want to use hotkeys for everything so i just learn as i go there's it's literally my default is what is the hotkey for that now i do want to take a second we're going to move on but i want to take a second to give a little uh pro tip for people this is something i picked up from the gaming world because i'm a gamer i used to have a g11 keyboard that has programmable macros. It lets you to basically assign specific keys or key combinations to one key press. I don't think that works very well anymore on like new Macs or new Windows, but I just ordered this new thing. It's called the XK24 USB programmable keypad. Go on Amazon, check this thing out. We'll have a link in the show notes. This thing has like 24 keys that you can assign to all sorts of cool shit inside of your DAW or even otherwise. I think even Chris, you could use this for some of your macros if you wanted to where you can have a separate keyboard that's to the left of your main keyboard that has all these cool things attached to it. When we start talking about systems inside of your session, using something like this can speed things up a lot. And I, I used to speed up drum editing a shitload back in the day with my old G11 keyboard. Yeah, so I'd say two things to that. One, Shout out to Better Touch Tools. It's all one word. It's a really cheap piece of software for Mac where you can say, hey, when I push the uh, F1 button, I want you to do all these things. It's amazing. So you can take a normal keyboard and make a bunch of amazing, crazy powerful macros. I use it all day, every day. Uh, number two is I think probably some people, not many, but I would say some of our listeners are probably thinking, boring nerd stuff. And I would say to you, Think of it like this. You're in a session, say you're editing or comping vocals or something. And let's say you forced yourself to use a mouse. You're using edit, copy, paste, and you're doing it a lot. And you're nudging things with the mouse. And sometimes that can work pretty well. But let's say you did that. How much extra time per hour would it take you to accomplish the same amount of work compared to if you were really fast with 
using the hotkeys for copy, paste, cut, all that stuff. Every time that you do something more slowly, you're becoming less efficient, which means you complete less work per hour, which means you make less money per hour. Depending on your pay structure. I mean, if we're talking about you're getting a day rate, that's why probably a lot of people aren't that fast because they're not really incentivized to get faster. But if we're talking about per project rate, which is what Chris and I are on, the faster you are, the more money you make. So there's a huge incentive to get faster. Yep. You can change your dollar per hour. Yep, absolutely. And one other point on this is the faster, the more efficient you can be, the more of an unfair advantage you have against your competitors to at least some degree. Amen. Well, go to the link in the podcast notes. We'll have a link to better touch tools. We'll have a link to the keyboard that Brian, the keyboards that Brian just mentioned. These are cool things. And it's a really inexpensive thing to invest 10, 20, 30, $40 in yourself to make yourself physically faster in the studio. And that's an immediate improvement on your dollars per hour if you're doing per project billing. All right. So that's it for session systems. Let's move on to our next big group of systems. And that is data systems. What do we mean by data systems? Because that sounds scary and corporate as fuck. It really does. So data, whether we like to admit it or not, as audio engineers, we're data guys. We have a ton of files. We have a ton of folders. I don't even want to tell you guys how many mastering session files I have on my computer. It's terabytes and terabytes. We use a lot of data, although we probably don't use as much as video guys do. Not even close. It's not even just a data issue in volume, gigabytes or terabytes. It's an issue of the number of individual files. How many folders do you have for, you know, maybe each folder represents a client or maybe each folder represents a, a project. The way that you organize those is important. Chris, how do you organize your data? Give me some of your secrets here. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I do as far as organizing my data is that each customer has a folder that is called their email address. Now, here's the reason for that. Email addresses are unique. There's no two people in the world who share the same email address who aren't like married or something. So when you call it an email address, you know it's a unique name. And when you're in their email, And you're thinking to yourself, well, where are their files on my computer? This is from an older project. I got to go find their session. All you have to do is take their email address. And if you're in a Mac, open up a finder window, hit Apple F and enter their email address in the find function. But a bing, but a boom, you're going to find their files right then and there. That saves a lot of time, especially if you are in a situation where you're doing a lot of smaller sessions or mastering sessions. And this can be a really big deal. And nobody wants to be in a situation where they lose a client's files or they're digging around looking for them. So I really think setting yourself up for success by having a consistent strategy where here's how I structure all my sessions. I got two things on that. So first of all, what happens when someone changes their email address? Say they reach out to you with a new email address and say, hey, I was with so-and-so band name. We're looking to get our songs remastered or something. What would the price be for that? How do you find these sessions on this band name they gave you without knowing their old email address? That's kind of a long explanation, but if I don't recognize the email address and they're talking about a previous project, I straight up ask them to email me through their old address and it makes it a lot simpler. And for me, this is, I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole, but bands break up and the mastering engineer can be in an awkward position when that happens. And by just saying, hey, email me through your original email address makes it so there's not this weird situation where this I have had this happen where like one guy is reaching out to me trying to get files and the other guy who's no longer talking to the other guy is emailing me and you're caught in the middle. I think it's important as an engineer to stick with a point person, at least in my world. Not it's not gonna apply for everybody. But if you know if need be if I have to, I just change the name of the folder. You know, if they're like I lost my old email address, which is a pretty big red flag for a customer. But yeah, it makes it easy if you're calling a folder their email address and then keeping everything for that person within that folder. That makes sense. So what is your folder hierarchy? I think that's this is an important thing to talk about if we're going to be on data systems. What is your folder folder hierarchy for your active sessions? Yeah, for me, what I do is I have this unbelievable hard drive from Otherworld Computing from OWC, and it's called the Thunder Bay. It has four four terabyte 7200 RPM hard drives in a RAID 5 array. And we're getting super dorky here, but that means I have eight terabytes. Is that right? More than that. It's a lot of terabytes of really, really, really fast access, like 500 megabits per second. Pretty quick. Because of that, I don't have to have like an active session 
area. I have one folder called session and I have a folder called session archive, which is sessions from years ago. Um, and everything's in there. So when I open up that sessions folder, everybody's session is right there in front of me. So it's literally just sessions and then the email addresses. That's literally it. That's it. Okay. Interesting. Mine's a little more complex than that. I have my sessions, my session folder, right? Then I have split into different services that I offer, mastering, mixing, tracking, and then reamping. Those are the four services I've offered in the past. I do just mixing and mastering now. And inside of each of those sessions, I have the band name. And then I have the year and month that I worked with them because sometimes I'm working with artists multiple times. And then I have the session files individually within that. So it's uh, easy for me to find specific albums for each artist, depending on when they came to me. Mm. Well, I think it's not really so important what you do as it is that you do it consistently. It's true. I've been consistent since day one with that hierarchy. All right, let's go on to archive sessions then. You said you do have an archive drive. I have multiple archive drives because of the amount of data I worked with when I was doing tracking. How do you handle your archive sessions? Yeah, I use Dropbox Pro. It's expensive. I think I pay like 80, 90 bucks a month for it. But because I have Dropbox Pro, I have virtually unlimited data with them. And I know that my files are backed up I can access them from my phone. I can access it from my laptop. I could be on vacation. And if someone's like, hey, uh, you know, we lost our record. Can you get our masters for us from two years ago? I'm like, Yes, I can. I still have them and I will still have them until, you know, Jesus comes again or until Dropbox goes out of business, whichever comes first. I ended up doing the same thing based on your recommendation. The, the cool thing about Dropbox business is that it has something called smart sync, which is you can see every single file, but it's not actually hosted on your computer. It's in the cloud, meaning I can have every session that I've ever done since I started using Dropbox and, and the ones that I've imported into Dropbox since using it. And it doesn't take any hard drive space up on my computer. It's amazing. That being said, I don't have every single session I've ever done because it takes a long time to just transfer them onto my drive and then upload them to the cloud. But I will say this, I just recently have an artist reached out to me for some old stems and, and masters that I did with them years and years ago. I can't find the drive, man. And this is due to a bad system. I spent a lot of time looking for it, a lot of wasted time. And that's what we're trying to avoid here. I just, I just moved and I just don't have all my shit organized the way I should. So realistically, I should have a really good system for me able to find the exact band or the exact year and service that I have on my old hard drives. But the problem is, you know, sometimes you get lazy with that stuff, man. And that was the, the case here, I think. Yeah. So Dropbox is great. Dropbox Pro is much better, but very expensive. Certainly not for everybody, especially if you don't have enough data to warrant, like, I think I have 12 terabytes of files in my <laughs> Dropbox Pro account. But yeah, a system like that, I had some really close friends of mine who had a studio here in Columbus, Ohio. They got broken into and the bastards stole their hard drives. Man, that's that's rough. It was it was like a community shattering event. That's why cloud backups are so nice for that fact right there. God forbid your place burned down. At least you do have your session files. Yeah. So I know this might seem like, oh, this isn't going to help me make more per hour. Well, if you lose an entire session or an entire record for a band you haven't finished work for, then it will certainly affect your dollars per hour. Yes. If you want to go back to episode three where Chris interviews me, you can find out what will happen to your psyche if you let that happen to you because that <laughs> happened to me in 2011. All right. So I think we covered data systems. The whole point of data systems is to minimize the time you're looking for shit. That's basically it. Minimize the time you're looking for shit on your computer. If you can really set up your systems in a way that allows you to find shit faster, you have eliminated the amount of time it takes you to search for things. I think they say the average person spends, I don't want to say an exact number because I don't remember the study, but it was a ridiculous percentage of their life looking for lost things. And I can say an audio engineer, safely say an audio engineer is probably double that number. Did you lose that stat? You used to have it and you can't find it now? <laughs> I just can't remember it. Well, let's refresh on what we've talked about so far. First, we tackled session systems and that was standard track labels, templates, plugin presets, and hotkeys, baby. And that entire thing was all about, uh, section one here, session systems is all about speeding your ass up in the studio. Yeah. You do this every day, hopefully. Well, you might as well make this as efficient of a process as possible. So systemizing and using things that are really speeding up your process in the studio, in your sessions, that's going to be huge for uh, making you more efficient. Absolutely. Number two was data systems. We covered active sessions, archive sessions, and file backup. Just one more thing with file backup. 
anything is good for file backup. I would prefer a system that does off-site backup automatically. There's all kinds of cloud systems you can get for five bucks a month. Backblaze. Backblaze, yes. A lot of our friends use Backblaze. And at night, it uploads files that you worked on that day. And for $5 a month, it's safe. And no one can steal your drives. Your studio can't burn down. You can't have a drive fail. Well, your studio can still burn down. You just won't lose your sessions. Well, it can. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, these, these are good things. It's like all of this stuff we've talked about, you know, there's a buffet here. But if you're someone that's like, I don't need to back up my files and you're doing this for a living, you are wrong, sir. Check yourself. You're wrong, ma'am. You need to do the file backup thing. That's true. All right, moving on to section number three here. This is physical systems. These are things that are in the physical realm, not the spiritual realm. We're going to talk about spiritual systems in a second. I'm just joking. We're not going to talk about spiritual (laughs) systems. But all right, physical systems. What do we mean by physical systems, Chris? Physical systems are physical. They are in space. They involve your studio, your storage systems, your body, all the things that are physical and sort of similar to session systems, but a little bit different. All right, let's talk about the first one we have here. And this is, this is 100% Chris Graham right here. I don't, I don't actually follow this, but this is, <laughs> he put on this outline here, OCD labels. Yes. Well, here's the thing. I will say I do own a label maker and I do have a few labels on a few things, but I am not OCD about it. That is for sure. Well, here's the thing. Um, my mom, my dad, my brother, anybody that knew me in college, anybody that knew me in high school will tell you, Chris is not OCD. As a matter of fact, he could use a little OCD in his life. I am a naturally messy person. However, um, as I've gotten older, I began to really get serious about organization, not because I want to be organized, but because I want to be smarter. I want to spend less time looking for something. I want to spend less time um, thinking or remembering something. And I have labeled the snot out of my life, out of my studio, out of even my closet in my house. There's like labels about like sweatpants go here and uh, t-shirts go oh here. Oh my God. It's intense. But as a result of it, as a result of that, it's really easy for me to keep things clean because I'm, there's never the, the decision of where should I put this? I'd put it right back where the label goes. And that seems super OCD. I'm not. Can you give me a label tour of your house one day? We're just going to get on FaceTime and you just show me all your labels of your house. Absolutely. We'll be giving label tours for $19 per month. Okay. For anybody that wants to subscribe from here on out. All right. Um, I bought the really sweet Bluetooth enabled brother label maker and you can you know, type something on your phone and you print it out. I really think the label maker is amazing. And here's how you can use it in the studio. So I've got in front of me, I've got the crane song. I have a set thing that every mastering engineer in the world has. I printed out labels and I labeled, hey, when you push this button, it'll make the sound come out of these speakers. When you push this button, it'll make the sound come from this interface or from this computer. So that sort of stuff to not have to look and say, oh, which which speakers were plugged into uh, out three or which digital input is digital one. It's just nice to have those labels there. And I just glance down, push the button and that's it. I don't have to access my memory and I'm not 100 percent, 100 percent of the time. If I'm exhausted, if I'm tired. That's when you start making mistakes. And yeah. any little thing that, that taxes your brain at that point is going to further drain you, which is going to further affect your sessions and your business. Yeah. So we'll put a link in the show notes, but there is a guy, if you guys are YouTube fans, you know him, Casey Neistat. He's such a good video maker guy. <laughs> oh, he's amazing. He is like content creator, content creator. That's the word I was going for there. <laughs> yeah. He's a great content creator. So my OCD with labels is really inspired by him. My family and I, we like to watch his YouTube videos and his studio in Manhattan or New York City or you know wherever in New York it is, is absolutely bonkers. But every single thing he has, has a place. And it's not OCD. Like he's like, he just, he's forced to, he has so much crap in that little tiny space that if he didn't have the amount of organization that he had, it would be a train wreck. He wouldn't be able to find anything. Absolutely. So get a label maker, start experimenting with that. Make a decision of where you're going to keep stuff, whether that's a microphone, microphone cable, whether that's labeling the talkback mic, you know, on your interface or what have you. That type of stuff makes you a little bit smarter and a little bit faster and a little bit less exhausted at the end of the day. Yep. All right. So The next system here in physical systems, you have, this is another Chris Graham one. I don't know if I took part in any of this physical systems stuff. Pegboards. What do you have pegboards on here, Chris? I love pegboards. 
Pegboards are those little weird pieces of wood with holes in them that you stick hooks in. And when I first bought my house in 2008, me and my wife were dirt poor. And someone in our neighborhood threw away 12 four by eight sheets of pegboard. And I picked them up, threw them on top of my Subaru, drove them home, and I put them everywhere. And combined with the power of a label maker and a bunch of metal hooks or plastic hooks that you can get for pretty much nothing on Amazon, you have a really cool visible system where all your certain cables are hung on a certain hook. And that makes it really easy to organize stuff. And it makes it quick where you can get to what you need fast. I've got all my tools set up that way. I've got all my cables. I've got basically all, all my mic stands are all, um, which I don't really use very often anymore because I'm a mastering engineer, but all my stuff is hung up on pegboards. This is a piece of the buffet that I'm interested in. So now I'm kind of looking up where I could put shit on a pegboard. They're awesome. So if you just like buy a lot of them, an obnoxious amount of them and the cheap plastic pegs that you can get on Amazon, everything's off the floor and it's pretty, it's hanging in a cool way and you can glance up and find something without even getting out of your chair. Pegboard's awesome. It's a great organizational system. I want to piggyback off the pegboards and just say, it's really not just pegboards you're talking about. It's just any sort of organization hardware. Yeah. And I think that kind of goes well for shelving. That goes for any sort of like cubby holes or little drawers, things that go in the corner. Like whatever it is that's cluttering up your desk right now or whatever it is that's cluttering up that corner of your studio, go on Amazon and just type in the word organization or organizing. And you're going to find all sorts of cool, weirdly shaped shit that goes in any little nook and cranny that you can start storing stuff in. You can find benches that have storage in them. You can find uh, little corner shelves that you can hang up anywhere. And what that does is it eliminates that clutter. There's a spot for everything and you no longer have your entire desk cluttered up with a bunch of crap. I'm looking at my desk right now and everything has a place, even though it shouldn't be on my desk, but I don't have a lot of my desk. I'm speaking to myself right now. I'm just kind of preaching to me. Totally cool. Well, and I think just to reiterate, I'm not OCD. Brian's not OCD. What we're into is self-improvement, being smarter and creating more value in this world. And we also don't wish OCD on anyone because it's actually no, we don't. a horrible thing. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. I, I, one of my good friends in college had OCD. So, but one of the things that's beautiful about these systems is it makes you a little bit smarter. It makes you a little bit faster. It makes you more money per hour because there's not this like interruption in your flow state. You can get into a flow state. You've got all your tools right there in the same way that drummers are meticulous about the snare should be in the same spot and the cymbal should be at the same height. It's so that they can get into a flow state. And in a studio, you have to be able to get into a flow state to make respectable money per hour. Yeah, if you're constantly searching for mic cables or little knickknacks here and there, and you don't know where they are, that pulls you out of your flow state. And that's going to damage your productivity for the day. And as a drummer, I relate to what Chris just said. If anyone's listening that is a drummer, imagine your snare drum being three inches higher <laughs> or three inches lower when you try to play or your ride cymbal being six inches further away. Like it's going to be very hard to hit that ride bell. There's all sorts of things that if it's out of place, it fucks with your, your flow, man. Yeah. And it's the same thing in the studio. I think just having a nice place for everything is, is the gist of this physical systems. Absolutely. It's a, a flow thing, not an OCD thing. All right. So the next system and final systems group we have here is communication systems. Communication systems, as far as I'm concerned, is anytime you're communicating with a customer, right? What are some systems you can have in place to make those things go smoothly? and to make sure nothing slips to the cracks. Is that basically what we have here, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest problems in our industry is that you mentioned this when we were planning for this episode. You get an email from a client asking for a revision or describing something they want, and it looks totally different. Sometimes you get clients that are just like, make it warmer. Oh God, I hate those people. And sometimes you get customers that send you a novel about all this other information that you don't need and that actually makes it more difficult to do your job. Oh, I take it back. I like the warmer people now and I hate the people with every <laughs> single detail. I'm like, if you know that much, just mix it yourself. <laughs> 101, don't communicate the way I just did. All right, so we have, <laughs> we have communication systems. The first one that we have on this list here is outsourcing work to your customers. And this is one I had it on the list. And this is basically what I mean. And this kind of goes with session systems as well. When I'm doing a mixing session, I don't want a Pro Tools session sent to me, which is weird because I have Pro Tools and most mixing engineers running Pro Tools wants Pro Tools sessions sent to them. Now, why don't I want Pro Tools sessions sent to me? Reason number one, 
their sessions are always going to be fucked in some way, shape or form. It's going to be completely different than the way I have my stuff set up. Nothing's going to be labeled the way I want it. Nothing's going to be colored the way I want it. It's going to be a train wreck. So instead I just send them a nice PDF. It gives them instructions, either the band or the engineer on how I want the session sent to me. And it's, it's basically this export a zeroed out session with wave files and organized in this folder hierarchy. That's basically it. And that means when I get the songs, it's organized and labeled the way I want it. And then I can simply, and I know you could do the same thing if you wanted the session files labeled the way you want it. But at the end of the day, the way I work is they sent me these files in this folder hierarchy that I want. All my, I have to do, or my assistant has to do is drag and drop those files into my session template. So we're kind of going back to session systems here with the templates and we're good to go. We're off and running with mixing from that point on. There's nothing trying to figure out their sessions. There's nothing, you know, it's just super fast. And that is just outsourcing a bit of work to my customers. Now there's a million ways you can do this. It's not just with session setup. It's not just with session prep. Chris outsources. What is it you do actually, Chris? Uh, track labeling. So we've mentioned this a few times on the podcast, but one of the things I'm really proud of in my systems is uh, when you go to send a mastering project to me, if it's an album or an EP, there's a question on a form before you can upload. And the question is, do you have a final track order? And if they answer yes, then it shows a message. It says, well, please label your files. 01 track name, 02 track name, 03, et cetera, et cetera. That way, when I get the files, their names are in the right order and I can just drop those into a session and they will organize themselves from first to last with their final track listing. So that sort of effort is great in that I don't have to do any follow-up emails to ask about track order. We literally don't need any emails about track order. Yeah. You send one guide to a customer and that eliminates two to three to four to five potential emails back and forth, which further it frustrates the customer. Yep. It frustrates you and it slows things down. And it keeps you from getting into a flow state. Yep. Uh, I think that's kind of the common theme here is staying in a flow state. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways you can outsource work to customers. Those are just a few of them. If you're looking for software to help you create forms to walk your customers through how to do some of this stuff. Yeah. This is called customer onboarding, by the way. If you are, I don't do this, but I probably should. And Chris definitely does this. When you get a new customer, there's some things you need to know. And I tend to get this information on the front end when they send a quote request to me. But realistically, I could probably get on the back end after they pay me. And there still is some stuff I get from them on the back end. But I really think, and I really need to do this, is when someone sends me a deposit, I send them a form to fill out that gets a lot of information I need for their project. And I think this is what Chris does, right? Yep, absolutely. And you're about to recommend a specific form software in order to get this data from them? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we just put a link to that in the show notes? We'll link to a few different types of form creation software, some free, some paid, some compatible with certain types of websites, some not compatible with those. So click the link in the show notes. We've got some tools in there that you guys can check out to create forms so that you can outsource some work to your customers. All right. So the next thing we have on our communication systems list here is an FAQ. We've talked about this in the past. I don't really have one. Uh, for four, five, six recordings, but you definitely have one. What do you mean by having an FAQ, Chris? An FAQ is huge. If you are niched down and you're doing a lot of the same types of projects again and again, and you get asked the same questions again and again, you should document those and put them on your website. It is so much better to train your customers that they can self-serve. They can find the information they're looking for quickly than for them to email you and then wait a day for you to respond. And then you email them back and they have another question and then they wait another day for them to respond and going back and forth, that slows things down and it turns customers off. I think it's really important and really, really helpful to have just a, a frequently asked questions section on your website and just to kind of always be working on it. Yep. And you have yours in your autoresponder, right? Yeah. So that brings us to our next item on the communication systems list. You know, we've talked a lot about the book for our work week in the past. And we've talked about autoresponders in the past too, but it, it goes without saying, if we're going to talk about communication systems, you damn well be sure we're going to add autoresponders to this list. Yeah. So an autoresponder, it's really easy to set up. It's kind of like a vacation responder in Gmail is you have a, an autoresponder that every person who emails you gets. So, you know, for me, it's chris at chrisgrandmastering.com. If you email chris at chrisgrandmastering.com, you'll get an auto response. And that auto response is just a, hey, we're here, we're alive. Here is what you can do to answer the most common questions that we have. Here's how to book a project. Here's how to get a free mastering sample. Here's how to download your files, et cetera, you know, if they've already been mastered. 
If you're curious to see my autoresponder, email me, chris at chrisgrammastering.com and say, hey, I just wanted to see your autoresponder. Thanks, bye. (laughs) And it'll come right back to you. And a lot of my autoresponders are linking back to my FAQ or certain sections of my FAQ. And that I think is really helpful for my customers because they don't have to wait for me to respond. They can self-serve. And as a result, I get to answer a few less emails and I get to help my customers a little bit faster. So check out the autoresponder. There is an art to it. Uh, Tim, Tim Ferriss talks about ways to craft a great autoresponder. And when I started using an autoresponder, it was just really helpful and palpable that I could tell that clients weren't as urgent to get the information that they wanted from me because basically just about anything you could possibly need is answered in the autoresponder, even though it's only, you know, I don't know, maybe 100, 200 words. Very short. I do want to give a shout out to Soundbringer Studios for being the only person, as far as I know, on the Six Figure Home Studio mailing list that uses an autoresponder. And that's because, (laughs) I know this because anytime he gets an email from me, I get an autoresponder from him. So if you're listening to this podcast, shout out. (laughs) Yeah, so do an autoresponder, even, even if it just says, hey, thank you so much for reaching out. I'll get back to you within, and then set an expectation within eight hours or within two business days or something like that. That's awesome. All right, so next thing we have on our list for communication systems, uh, and this is one that I thought we should add, and that is approvals. And what I mean by approvals is if you are, let's just say you're mixing an album for an artist. I've done this before in my past. I've, I've fucked this up and I've seen other people fuck this up. If I'm mixing an album for an artist, and I mix the entire album and send it to them and they hate it, I just wasted so much time, effort, energy, and mental bandwidth and emotion on mixing 10 songs that I basically have to scrap and start over on because I got none of it right. So if you are just starting out or you haven't made this mistake or for some weird, dumb reason, you don't do this already, just do one song. Mix, master, whatever service you're offering, do one song, see what they think about it, get feedback, get approvals, Uh, And most importantly, make sure you're happy with it on multiple systems before you go to the rest of the songs, because this is going to save a lot of time, effort, heartache, and frustration in your career. If you're able to just do one song, get an approval, get feedback, and go from there instead of stressing over getting all 10 songs perfect and then ultimately getting, wasting a lot of time on an unapproved mix. Yeah. Well, and I have a lot of experience with that because my business model is based on me doing a free mastering sample of one song. And what I recommend people do is you have a mastering contest, you send the same song to a few people, you have them all master a sample, you see who you like the best. Real simple. What I typically do is I do two mastered samples. I'll do a little bit less compressed and a little bit more compressed. I'll send those both back. And the beauty of that is it's one song to start with. So when they end up hiring me to do the record, they'll typically say, oh, we love sample two that you did. Oh, awesome. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to use that as a starting place for your entire album. And because we've started the conversation there, I almost always get the full set of masters approved on the first round of masters. It's like 95% of the time the first round gets approved. And a lot of that's because there's that one free sample, that that reference point of, hey, we really liked what you did there. Could you do something like that with the record? That's so helpful. And I, I know there's a temptation to just want to dive in and bust your butt and finish the whole thing and send it to them and say, here... But that's a dangerous road to go down because you might end up wasting 40 hours that you then have to go back and say, oh, well, I edited all those drums and apparently you guys didn't want me to edit any of the drums and no one ever told me that. And I just thought you should because they weren't very good. And now I just wasted all this time. Yep. So try to do it in bite size, something that's going to take you just a fraction of the amount of time, get some quick feedback, get approvals, and then move on with the rest of the project before you commit to spending the next 60 hours working on something that you have no idea if they're going to accept or not. All right. So that's it for the approvals systems. Uh, Let's move on down to email templates and saved replies. This is huge. Uh, If you use a CRM, we talked about CRMs back in episode number seven, the CRM episode, billion dollar companies use this software and so should you. If you don't use a CRM, I recommend going back and listening to that episode. You can go to the show notes page, the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash seven. That's the number seven. And you can listen to that episode. But the gist of the entire system is besides the follow-up reminders that it gives you, it allows you to save a lot of templates for a lot of different scenarios. That's a huge time saver. You don't have to use a CRM to use saved replies and templates. You can use them in Gmail. Gmail has saved templates and saved replies, right? Yeah. So let's talk about this a little bit more. 
why would I need an email template? Why would I need saved responses that I can... It's because you're going to send the same damn email out 20 times a day if you don't. <laughs> yeah, bingo. So fun story with that. When my business started taking off, this would be about 10 years ago, I was writing the same emails again and again. People would say, well, what about MP3s or something like that? After I'd send masters back and I would, ha- I would sit down and I would type out a paragraph about MP3s and I would send it back to them. And then 10 minutes later, I'd get another question from a different customer about MP3s. Yeah. You will literally never scale your business if you ever, if you replied like that to every one of your inquiries. Yeah. And funny story. So my, I told my wife about this and she said, huh, you know, those uh, signatures you can have in OSX mail. What if you just saved the reply as a signature and then you could just select it and email it back. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I started doing that and it was unbelievable. And it usually, you know, I try to make them, here's more info about in bold and then a paragraph about that. And most of the time it's literally copied and pasted from my FAQ. And it's awesome because I am so fast at getting back to customers when they have a question because, you know, at this point I've worked with thousands of people. I've probably been asked that question whatever question they have in the past, at least that's true 99.9% of the time. And I can send them, you know, an answer that I have crafted and really taken seriously and isn't riddled with grammar errors and all that stuff. Yeah. It's like you can give them one really well thought out, well typed out reply, the exact same reply, or you can try to do this shout out. I don't have time for this. So I'm just going to give you a really crappy, hasty answer with a lot of typos in it to every person individually. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'd rather have that well-crafted template reply than that shout out personal reply, to be honest with you. Yeah. So if you guys are in a situation with your businesses where you are typing essentially the same email more than a few times a week, create a saved reply. You can do it in OSX mail. You can do it. Um, there's a plugin. You can do it in Gmail for, I think it's called saved replies. Basically every CRM or help desk software that helps you manage your email is going to offer that service as well. Chris and I both use close.io as our CRM and Help Scout as our help desk software. You can go to the show notes uh, on the website to find that. Yeah, both amazing pieces of software. So last but not least, have you ever been in a situation, Brian, where you did a record, it turned out great, the client approved it, and then a month later, they unapproved it? Oh God, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and honestly, like sometimes you can't avoid that, right? Yeah. You can have policies in place, but at the end of the day, do you want to stick to a policy and piss someone off? And, or do you want to just bow to their whims and make them happy? You know, sometimes you got to go one way or the other just to make people happy. But at the end of the day, revision systems can help with this stuff a lot. Now let's talk about how I handle revisions personally. When you're doing revisions for an album and you send, let's just say the first version of a full album off to a band, you could send 10 different bands the same album and they'd send you revisions back 10 different ways, right? Yeah. It's just because every single person's brain works differently. And so if you're trying to decipher like, okay, they're going through all vocal revisions in a row and then they're going through all drum revisions, but this other band or this other person in the same band is giving me all revisions period in a chronological order. It can take you a time to go through it because of the way your session set up and the way you work. It's just, everyone's a little different. So the way I handle this, Chris, is I send them a nice template to reply. This kind of goes with templates but it is a system for them to arrange the revisions in a very specific way, in a very specific order with timestamps and everything. It allows them, first of all, to organize the revisions in a very easy way for them to all go through. And it also allows me to go through and just check off these revisions quickly and efficiently. One more thing on top of that is when I'm doing a mixing session or even mastering session, I have all songs in one session in Pro Tools. And so when I bounce down a mix for that you know, 10 song album that's 45 minutes long, all 10 songs are going to be 45 minutes in a row with maybe 20, 30 seconds between songs. And I'm going to bounce one long ass track out and send it to the band for revisions. And what that allows is that one long ass track matches up perfectly with the timestamps inside of Pro Tools. So 30 seconds into the song is 30 seconds into my Pro Tools session. 45 minutes into the songs or album is 45 minutes into my Pro Tools session. So when they're going through and they're giving me timestamps for the entire session, it allows me to just go from start to finish down the entire thing and knock out revisions super, 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 super fast. So when you couple this system of everything in the same session, if your computer can handle it, which I've been doing this since I started in 2009, so there should be no problems here, especially with freezing tracks and stuff, you know, 
Coupling it with the long one session for everything and coupling that with the way you ask them to arrange their revisions is going to speed up your revision process 10x. And not only that, uh, it's probably going to allow you to get revisions done to a higher standard, I believe. Yeah. Well, one of the things I do on my website is I have a revision form. So I don't get asked for revisions very often, but when I do, I don't, I don't get asked for revisions often, but when I do... I was about to say, Mr. Interesting Man. Um, when I do, um, I have a form that they fill out. And I explain at the beginning of the form, hey, I know it might be a little bit annoying to fill out a revision form, but this form is going to help me get the revisions back to you super fast. And what I have found since I rolled that form out is that I often get the revisions back within like hours during normal business hours, sometimes less than an hour because I've got everything I need right there in front of me. I can reopen their session. I can do it and kick it out and get it back fast. Clients hate long revisions. It is the worst for them. And it's the last thing they're going to remember about working with you is the revision process. So you got to get the revision process right. You have to do it in a way that honors the client and that gives them what they're looking for quickly. So go in more detail. You say you use a form for your revisions? Yeah. So one of the things you run into with mastering, and I don't want to get too into the weeds here, is that when you're doing revisions for a client, it's important to check that they've listened to the masters or the mixes on more than one set of speakers. When I was down in Nashville, we were at a really, really, really high-end studio and the mix engineer mentioned that he had turned out a really, really famous record and got bad revision requests because the client had only listened to the mixes on iPod headphones, which the mix engineer had given him. And so, of course, the revision requests were stupid. They were only applicable to optimizing the mixes or the masters for iPod headphones. So I think one of the best parts about systemizing revisions is just making sure that your clients have listened in a few environments. And a lot of times what I'll find is that, especially with, I don't know why this is, but especially with singer, songwriter, or solo artists, they will go out in their car and they will turn it up 10 times louder than anyone will ever listen to their music. And they're only going to give you revisions to make the record sound better when it's turned up that loud. Those revisions will not necessarily improve how the record sounds when it's listened to at average listening volume levels. So systems that can just double check that your artist isn't sending you on a wild goose chase are important. The other thing there is I had a client just this last week who was like, man, I went to listen to the masters and, you know, there's static at, you know, 30 seconds and it almost made me go deaf. And I went back and listened to the master and there's no static. And, you know, sent him through the revision system. And what it was, was it was an issue with his device. He lost clock sync or something like that. And so just checking that, that they are checking on more than one system, more than one sets of speakers, if they're having issues or they're hearing, say, distortion, that that distortion is your fault and not because they're turning it up too loud or because they're using a cassette adapter in their car <laughs> and it sounds like crap. So systems to double check that that's not an issue. I had, say, one more story here. I had a really close friend who sent me a record a few years back and I sent him the master's. And it was a really, really cool record. A lot of saturation, a lot of kind of avant-garde electronic music. And he sent me back an irritated revision request that he was hearing distortion in the masters. And I was like, oh, geez. And finally, after going back and forth a few times, I asked him, are you hearing the same distortion at the same times in the unmastered mixes? And he finally went back and he checked. And he was like, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and so a system, at least for me as a mastering engineer, is really valuable to just make sure that question is asked. If, if they're saying, oh, I hear distortion or I hear a pop or a click, well, do you hear that in the unmastered mix as well? If, you know, if it's snuck by me. And that's, those types of systems are really valuable, especially when you're doing a lot of projects to just make sure that the client isn't sending you on a wild goose chase so that you can get, and here's the point, so that you can get the revision done as soon as possible or that you can say, oops, that was an issue in the original mix or, you know, whatever, or, or that was an issue in the original track. So those types of situations being just sort of crossed off the list keeps you from pissing the client off and it keeps you in a position where you're able to say, yeah, no problem. I'll have that for you in a couple hours. And man, when you end a project with a client where they're like, man, either A, they didn't have any revision requests. Which is such a good feeling. Such a good feeling. Or B, they did have revision requests and you got it back super fast. They're thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, I love this guy. It's a really powerful thing. So the revision systems, not to be underestimated, to just sort of like fly by the seat of your pants and make up your revision system each time can be 
problematic and can leave a bad taste in the client's mouth. Yep. So just kind of wrapping this whole systems conversation up, pick and choose from this episode of what you think is most important. And honestly, what is the biggest pain point of the things we talked about? What is that thing that you said, God, I hate when that happens. And that's probably the one you need to focus on or the one or two you need to focus on. If you try to focus on all of these at the same time, you're probably going to burn yourself out. But if you can just pick one or two of these things out and put it into your business and commit to making this a priority for the next couple of days, maybe even a couple of weeks for some of these, uh, I think it's going to make a big improvement in your experience and maybe even your relationships with some of your artists. Absolutely. And my last thought here, we've talked about this in the podcast as well, but I really believe in the importance of scheduling time to work on your business, not for your business. Yeah, we talked about seasons of marketing. We've talked about seasons of systems and Chris is in a season of systems right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say piggybacking off what you said about, you know, you pick whatever thing we just said that you're like, oh, I hate when that happens. Pick that to work on first. Schedule time to fix that issue by creating a system for it. And then what's going to happen is once that system comes into play, this should probably be the the lowest hanging fruit, whatever will immediately save you the most time. Then you're going to have time to go back and pick the next lowest hanging fruit. And then you're going to start to have a little bit more free time. You're going to start to have a little bit more flow time. And you're going to start to be in a position where you're making a little bit more per hour. Yeah. And if your excuse is, I don't have time to do this stuff, (laughs) you are the person that needs this more than anything. Yeah. So you have to find the time to do this stuff if you have no time to do this stuff. Well, it's like, remember uh, in Austin Powers, I'm sad because I eat and I eat because I am sad. Like if you don't have the time to work on this stuff, it's because you haven't worked on this stuff. It's a catch-22. You got to find time. You, you have to. That was like the worst impersonation I've ever done in my life, by the way. It was. I didn't want to say anything to embarrass <laughs> you, but I think the listeners had those thoughts already, so I don't have to really <laughs> add any fuel to that fire. So that is it for my conversation with Chris Graham. Hopefully you found that episode uh, enlightening. As always, you can go to the show notes for this episode and get all the links that we mentioned. Anything that has a link associated with it, it's on the show notes page. So just go to the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash 26. That's just the numbers two and six. And then one final little reminder here. Anyone who leaves a review in the month of May, just screenshot your review post it in our Facebook community and I'll be giving you a free one-on-one coaching session. Uh, Go back to the beginning of this episode if you forgot the details with that. Uh, And again, this is not going to be the most ass-kissing review. We're not looking for ass-kissing reviews. We're looking for the most helpful reviews. People that have never heard about the Six Figure Home Studio, never heard about this podcast, and they're just looking to the reviews to see uh, what this thing is about. The person that leaves the most helpful reviews, I will be giving a free one-on-one coaching session to you. Uh, After the month of May, I'll pick my favorite one. So screenshot your review, post it in the Facebook community, uh, and then I will take care of the rest. Next week, we're going to be talking to a guy by the name of Matt Boudreau. This is uh, a guy that hosts a a popular podcast. It's called Working Class Audio. If you're not a subscriber of that already, I I recommend going to check that out. Matt is a friend of ours. He's part of our um, mastermind group that Chris and I meet with on Friday mornings. And he's been, I would say, the you could call him the, the dad for the Six Figure Home Studio. He's helped us a lot when we were planning our podcast and, and planning the launch for that. And our conversation with, with Matt for next week is fantastic. So I, I look forward to you hearing uh, our interview with him. Again, that's next week, next Tuesday, actually, at 6 a.m. Get ready for that interview to go live. So until next time, happy hustling and take care. Whoa.